You and me. Because why? We don't spend time with God. And when you spend time with God, you then form a relationship with God. That's the R in trust. Forming a relationship with God means that not only do you speak to God, you then quiet yourself and listen to God. No relationship grows unless there's a give and a take. You know, oftentimes, I I come from a diocese that is only 3% Catholic. 3%. And there are a lot of very, very, very fundamental, fundamentalistic churches and very evangelical churches. And they love to ask the question, you know, have you accepted Jesus? I'll never forget I was on an airplane flying from Houston to Orlando. You'll never believe who sat next to me. You'll never believe it. What? Well, you have to wait. who sat next to me was a man named Joel Olstein. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, so I'm in my hoodie and my shorts and my sandals, and he comes and sits next to me. And one of the things I've learned while flying on an airplane is you do not make eye contact. Because when you make eye contact with someone... You become engaged with that person. You engage that individual. And so, when Mr. Olstein came and sat next to me, you know, I said, I'm not, nope. I mean, I got to do, I I do got to tell you, he has amazing hair. I mean, no, no. I just want, no. Look at this and look at his. I mean, it is well-groomed. You know? And I could see out of the corner of my eye him trying to get my attention. Nope. And then the flight attendants came by checking for seatbelts and they said to me, Sir, and I said, Yes. And when I turned to look, guess what? We engaged. And he looked at me and he said, Brother, And I said, yes, and he has gorgeous teeth. (laughs) No, really, look at these. Uh Uh-uh, you know? He has gorgeous teeth, and he said, brother, and I said, yes. He said, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I said, excuse me? He said, do you have Jesus in your heart. And I said, Mr. Olstein, and he said, yes. I said, not only do I have Jesus in my heart, but as a Roman Catholic priest, I receive Jesus every day in the Eucharist, in the body and blood of... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not okay. You asked, so now you have to listen. Time, relationship, understanding. You is the understanding in trust. You see, a lot of people don't trust God because a lot of people don't know God. My brothers and sisters, God never promised us everything we want. God promised us everything we need, and there's a difference. 
Do you understand? The only way you're going to understand God is by reading the Word of God, by allowing God to speak to you in, in, in stories and in sharing and in understanding of how God operates. As I told the people today, God gave us the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. You see, I think a lot of people call themselves Catholics without understanding what it means to be Catholic. People often ask me why I don't stand up and constantly preach about abortion. Well, one of the reasons why is you should know my stance on that. That's number one. But number two is that as a Catholic, I am pro-life from womb to tomb. In other words, there has to be a balance. That not only am I preaching against abortion, but I'm also preaching against the death penalty, preaching against elder abuse, preaching against people treating others unfairly and hostile. You have to understand your faith. And you also have to understand your God. And you, above all, you have to understand that God knows you <laughs> because God created you. You know, there's a wonderful story in my book. You can get that online too. But there, there's a wonderful, on my website or at Barnes & Noble or wherever you shop, but there's a, there's a wonderful story in there about my mom, and I understand. You see, I, I understand my mom because I've spent time with her, I've had a relationship with her, I, under, you know, I understand how she operates. I wish you would have met her. She would have been here, third pew. I'll tell you two stories about her. One is, whenever I would perform wherever I would perform. I don't care if it was New York City. I don't care if it was in the Philippines, in Manila. I don't care if it was in Tokyo, Japan. Wherever I would perform, when I would walk out on stage and I would look up and I would look down, there she would be, third row center orchestra. Even when she didn't have a ticket, she would show up there. I'm not joking. I had to have written into the contract that they could not sell four seats in the center section on row three because she would just come in with her lady friends and sit right there. My son's performing. <laughs> and as I would perform, my mother would give me a set of signals and signs during the performance. <laughs> Fix your hair. That's when I had hair. Straighten your bow tie. You stink. <laughs> I'm not joking. And one day, while performing in Louisville, Kentucky, backstage came two bishops. They had read in my biography of my great love of the Catholic Church, my great love and devotion of the Eucharist. It was before I was ordained. And they asked me to come and speak to an event. The place was packed. I bought, I had a suit made and I had a great tie on. And I remember walking out to this packed cathedral 
And I looked up, and I looked down, and there she was. Not third row center orchestra, but third pew center cathedral. And as I began to walk around and speak, as I'm doing today, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, my mother giving me a signal that I had never, ever seen before. This is what she was doing. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because I've never seen her do it. And she kept doing it over and over again. It became so distracting. No, I'm serious. People over here started looking. You know, they didn't know she was my mother. They just saw this woman. So finally, I sat down. Can I tell you something? When I sat down, my four foot nine Italian mother stood up in front of everyone. And she screamed out. She said, Jimmy, didn't you see me give you your signal? I said, Ma, I don't know what that means. She goes, Menage. It means get behind the pulpit and pull up your zipper. <laughs> I'm not joking. Okay, so you see, I understand my mom. But let's take that a step further. If you truly trust your God, let me ask you a question. What kind of signals and signs are you giving off to one another? When you leave this church tonight, or look back at today, what kind of signals and signs did you give to people? Were they led to Jesus today because of your signals and your signs? It's a good question to ask. You see, if you really trust God, you're going to spend time trying to improve your life. You see, if you come to this church week after week after week and you're the same person inside and out, there's something wrong. You see, as a preacher, you know, I, I can already hear some people saying, oh, Father, you better watch out. Tomorrow is the giving night, so you don't want to get them upset. No, see, as a preacher, I'm called to preach what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And sometimes you're going to leave very frustrated. Time, relationship, under I'll give you another understanding. This is one of my favorite stories of my mom. You see, my mother, one day... In, in December, I think it was like December 18th, I was preaching in Europe and my mother called me and she said, Jimmy, I've decided to have a family meeting and all of your brothers and sisters, remember I'm the youngest of five, are flying home tomorrow. So please be here. I said, well, Mother, I'm in England. And I'm here speaking. So I'll have to come there later. And she said, Jimmy, I'm your mother, and we'll see you tomorrow. And she hung up. <laughs> what do you do? I canceled my speaking engagements, and I flew home. So as I'm sitting at home with all my brothers and sisters, we're trying to figure out why Mother has called us together. And in comes the matriarch. And she sits in her chair in the den. And she says, 
I have decided that we need to bond as a family. Now, let me get this straight. We're, we're all grown. You know, I have two brothers that graduated from the Naval Academy. I have an older sister who is a retired teacher. Another sister that oversees athletics. Okay, and then the pre. We're, we're all like, what? Yes, I've decided that we need to bond as a family. So I have signed us all up today at 11 a.m. for a CPR class at the American Red Cross. <laughs> let, let me just get this straight. So I flew eight hours from Europe and I canceled all of my speaking events so that I can take a CPR class with my brothers and sisters and mother. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. Okay, you get it? So we all took the class. We all bonded. We all passed the class. Now, what do Italians do when we celebrate? We eat. So my mother came up with another amazing idea. She said, why don't we finish our Christmas shopping at the mall and eat at the food court? Well, my brothers and sisters, have you ever been to a mall on the last week before Christmas? So as I'm walking with my four foot nine mother and my brothers and sisters into the Parkdale Mall in Beaumont, Texas, into the food court, what does my mother see in the middle of the food court? But a man lying on the floor with people surrounding him. And what does she do? She takes off screaming, I have just been certified in CPR. I have just been certified in CPR. She's holding up her card. She breaks through the crowd. She lands on top of the man and she begins chest compressions. And the police officers pick her up and say, excuse me, ma'am, we're trying to arrest this man for shoplifting. <laughs> Now, you see, for someone else, they may say, well, your mom's a little... No, I understand my mom. You see, I don't think... I really don't think a lot of people understand God. They expect of God things that God has never promised. Time, relationship, understanding. And here comes a biggie. And we've seen it now even more so with COVID. And that is, it is very hard for us to surrender and let go. My brothers and sisters, when we make a mistake, when we sin, we have to surrender to God. We have to get ourselves to confession. We have to reconcile ourselves, do our penance, and then come back to be part of the community. Well, Father, I don't like going to confession. Guess what? It's not about you. Get over it. No, I'm serious. It's about you rejoining the faithful, you becoming part of the community, restoring the grace that God gives you through the sacraments. We as Catholics are not a me theology. It is not about what I want. You know, I'll never forget when I was a pastor and it was three minutes till Mass was to begin on a weekend, and I didn't find, I, we, the, the reader didn't show up, the lector, the minister of the Word. So I went out, and I just turned to someone, and I said to this woman, I remember, I said, excuse me, um, 
I need you to read. Oh, I don't read. I don't read. <laughs> what? You're 37 years old and you don't read? Oh, no, I don't read public. Well, get over it. It's not about what you like to do. The church is in need. And so we step up to the plate. You see, that, that's why I'm grateful for all of you here today and yesterday and hopefully tomorrow. This speaks volumes that in the midst of a pandemic, you are hungry for the Word of God. Time, relationship, understanding, surrendering. And now here's the next part. And that is that we're called to just try. Try. That's all that God asks of us, is that we try, is that we make the effort, that we get outside of our boat, outside of our comfort zone, and we just try. You see, that's why all of you will be blessed from being at this mission, because you made the effort, you tried. You got yourself out of your car, out of your home, you masked up, you socially distanced, and you got here. Time, relationship, understanding, surrendering, trying. You can apply that to any and every story. What was the story this weekend? Anyone remember the gospel story? Excuse me? Well, hold on one second. What was it? That's right. Walking on the water. So let's apply T-R-U-S-T -T to that. You ready? How did Peter walk on the water? Number one, Peter and Jesus spent time together, right? They spent time together. And so by spending time together, they formed a relationship. Peter saw what Jesus could do, yes? He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He saw people, Jesus cure people who were sick. He saw Jesus uh, do amazing things. Jesus also had a relationship with Peter. He understood how Peter operates. Yes? Yeah. He knew that Peter constantly put his foot in his mouth. Who was it? Can I ask you a question? Who was it that asked Peter to walk on the water? Who said that? That's exactly right. You get a bottle of water. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. You also, you also get a papal cross. One second. Here you go. A cross from Pope France. I'll have it. Hold on one second. I'll have to look for it. It's, yes. So, so that's right. It was Peter. Remember? He said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come walk on the water. And what happened? Jesus said, come on. Isn't it interesting that no one else got out of the boat? Let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters. If I was in that boat, I would have jumped out of that boat, pushed Peter down, and ran to Jesus. Yeah, but 11 other guys sat in the boat and did nothing. And I wonder something. How many of us are the 11 in the boat? How many of us come to church week after week after week after week and do nothing? Time, relationship, understand. And then, what did he do? He jumped out of the boat and he surrendered to God's will and he did something humanly 
impossible. He walked on water. And then there's always someone negative in the group. Always, wherever you go, there's always someone negative that says, oh, but he sank. Oh, but he tried. And he made the effort. And he's one of the few, if not the only one, who was picked up by Jesus out of the sea and through God's mercy walked on water because he trusted. You see, I never doubt God's providence. Even in the midst of this COVID, I was talking to people today, not once, not once have I wavered. Not once, thanks be to God, have I been fearful. Because God always provides. It doesn't mean that you're not going to sacrifice. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be pain. It doesn't mean that you're not going to endure struggle. What it does mean is that God will never abandon you. That God will always be with you. You see, I'll give you a story. This is, this is probably one of the most amazing stories that I've ever experienced. So, tomorrow I'll take up an offering. If you put in a card or a letter or a check or something with your address on it, I always write handwritten thank you notes. It's what my parents always taught me. Handwritten thank you notes. And so people ask, when do you have time to do that? I do it on the airplane. That's when I have time to do it. And so I had just left Chicago Air... I, I was speaking in Chicago in Glen Ellen, Illinois. I was speaking there, and instead of going back to Kentucky, I had to go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to speak at a convention that was being held at the William Penn Hotel. So, while I'm going through the gifts that people had given me uh, from Chicago, there was a check from a Mr. and Mrs. Um, Michael Ramler for one thousand dollars. Now for me that's big. That's a big gift. And so I noticed something on the check. On the memo line, Mr. and Mrs. Mike Ramler, on the memo line, put in very large print their cell number. Now why, you know, I was, I looked at that and I said, now why would they do that? So you know what I did, don't you? No, I'm on an airplane. I can't call them on the airplane. I texted them. Because you can't call on the airplane, but you can text. You connect to GoGo -Go Wi-Fi. You cannot call on an airplane. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. That is against FAA. You cannot... No, no. You might, if you're the president, you might be able to, but you can't as a... When was the last time you flew? A year ago. Did you call someone on the plane a year ago? Excuse me? You put it in airplane mode. That disconnects your cellular service. You're in the third pew. Are you Italian? What is your name? What is it? Joanna what? 
What's your Italian name? Your last name. Your, your maiden name. The Oreo. The Oreo. Oh. I just got chills. You could, my mother could be reincarnated there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't use your phone. You can, you can, you can connect to Wi-Fi. So I texted them. I said, dear Mr. and Mrs. Ramler, I just received your check. I'll write you a, a thank you note, but I'm headed to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania now to speak. Be assured of my prayers. Ding. Ding. I look, and guess who it's from? Who is it from? The Ramblers. And this is what they say. Father Jim, we're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Our 19, our, sorry, sorry, our 24-year-old nephew... Russell is dying of pancreatic cancer at Allegheny General Hospital. Please pray for him. Ding! Be assured of my prayers. As now I'm flying into Pittsburgh, what do you think my heart is telling me? What is my mind telling me? What? My mind is saying, I don't have time. I have a speaking engagement. I don't have time. But you always follow your heart when it is sound and informed. That's where you trust. And so I got in the car, the rental car from Hertz, and I began driving to Allegheny General Hospital 70 miles in the opposite direction. And as I'm driving, I am speeding. And about 10 minutes from the hospital, I look in the rearview mirror, and guess who I see? the Pennsylvania State Police. And they pull me over, and I look in the rearview mirror, and my worst nightmare comes to play as the individual getting out of the car is not a seasoned trooper, but a young trooper that looks like he just got out of trooper school. Do you know what I'm talking about? Green. It's no different than if you ever get a brand newly ordained priest. They do everything by... You understand what I'm saying? And I can say that because I used to be there. So the trooper comes to the car. I already have my driver's license and rental agreement. It's not my first rodeo. So I said, I said, um, he said, do you have your driver's license and re registration? I said, yes, this is a rental car. Here's this. And he looks at me and he says, Father, do you know how fast you were going? No, I don't. Sorry. He says, do, I, do you know why I pulled you over? No, nope. no, I don't. No, I don't. I mean, it could be for many things. It could be speeding. It could be welcome to Pennsylvania. It could be, no. Why am I going to give him ammunition? No, I don't know why you pulled me over. Tell me. He said to me, is there an emergency? Why, yes, there is. Why, yes, there is an emergency. There is a 24-year-old man named Russell who is dying of pancreatic cancer at Allegheny General Hospital. And the, the trooper goes, is he a parishioner of yours? And I'm like, read the driver's license. I'm not from here. 
He can't be a parishioner of mine. No. He said, well, then, how do you know him? I don't know him. And you could see his wheels turning. He, I said, I know his aunt and uncle, Mr. and Mrs. Mike Ramler, they gave me a $1,000 check. He goes, oh, so you know the uncle? No, I don't really know them. I've never met them. For 10 minutes, he questions me over and over and over. And then he says, Father, Russell is my younger brother. He brings me to the, escorts me to the, to the hospital where I baptize Russell, I give him First Holy Communion, I confirm him, I give him the anointing of the sick, and then two weeks later with the Bishop of Pittsburgh, I buried Russell at St. Paul's Catholic Cathedral in downtown Pittsburgh. You see, my brothers and sisters, you never know. God always provides. There's the selfie. God always, always provides if you allow God. Do you see? At every moment, God uses you. Every moment. I'll never forget, I got pulled over one time. I got pulled over. They were laughing over there. I was going from Lexington to Houston to visit my mother, and I got pulled over on Interstate 55 in Mississippi, right outside of Jackson, Mississippi. I was in some sweat clothes, and the trooper came up to the car, and he was talking to me, and I said, I know I was going fast, but, but I want to go home. I haven't seen my mom in about four weeks, and I just wanted to go home, and he wrote me a warning ticket. So it wasn't a ticket, it was just a warning. Three weeks later, I'm driving northbound. Hey, hey, don't judge. I'm driving northbound on Interstate 55 outside of Jackson, and I get pulled over by the same exact trooper. And he comes to the car. He asks for my driver's license and registration. And he says, do I know you? And I said, you should. You pulled me over three weeks ago going southbound. What are you doing working northbound? And he wasn't happy about that. And he asked me out of the car. And he began to ask me questions. And one of the questions was, what is your occupation? And I said, oh, you don't want to know that. He said, sir, I'm not playing with you. What is your occupation? I said, I'm a Roman Catholic priest. He said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no, I am. He said, you'll never believe this. He said, but I am Southern Baptist, and I have felt called for several years towards the Catholic faith. But I can't tell my family because I'm afraid they'll disown me. And I really haven't had the courage to talk to anyone here because my family is very well known. And he said to me, would you mind, would you mind going to the next exit pulling off at the Waffle House and just 
for 10 minutes taking some time to answer some questions. And I said, it depends. <laughs> That's what I said. Two years later, with the Bishop of Jackson, Mississippi, I welcomed that trooper into full communion into the Catholic Church. It's not impossible. Each of you are vessels of Jesus. Each of you, through your baptismal promises, are priests. Every one of you. Each of you are called to minister. Each of you are called to be prophetic. Each of you are called to be leaders of the faith. I'm gonna, I'll sing a song tonight, a different song, but a song that you know. Don't sing with me, just listen. Not that you can't sing well, but I want you to hear the words. Because you know this song because it, it, it's such a, a great song, but I think it speaks to the essence of who we are as Christians, as Catholics. Listen to this. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. O oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood, as to understand, to be loved, as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. In giving of ourselves that we receive. And in dying that we're born to eternal life. And you see, that's the message, that no matter what takes place, our God is with us, that our God will bring us joy when our hearts are broken, that when we are ill, that the divine physician will come and heal us. That's why I want again want to thank Father 
Ed and Miss Kislow. Because, because why? Because, again, we could have canceled this event. You see, it's easy to cancel. It's harder to arrange social distance and masks and all of that live stream. But God is worth it. The grace from this mission is worth it because we're all brothers and sisters. I'll give you this final story and then it's time to go. And, and the, the final story is, is this. Um, and don't forget about online. You can go and get your sauce if you need to or books or anything like that. And don't forget tomorrow is our final night. We'll have an offering taken up and then we'll go forth. And don't forget, if you want to come tomorrow at 1.30, we have a, a small little group. There were, I don't know how many people there were today, but it was a nice group and we were able to do questions and all of that. And one of the questions, two quite, one of the questions that was asked of me from Father here today at lunch when I couldn't pay for my hamburger because I didn't have a, a cash, um, I came back and thank God they were having lunch in the rectory and I, I took their food. And um, I did, didn't I? Oh, by the way, sorry, I'm constant. Let me answer your question. He asked me, you know, how do I get these speaking engagements? All of my speaking engagements, every one of them, is all by word of mouth. Someone here, Father, had heard me speak somewhere else in New Jersey, and he invited me. Every speaking engagement is by all word of mouth. You tell someone who tells their priest who then contacts me. That's how it works. And when that stops, it's time for me to move on. You see, that's, that's how it works. Now, I do have a request. I just realized this. And you're going to laugh, but this is what I'm in need of. If someone can get me this by 1 o'clock tomorrow, are you ready? My oldest brother... You know, both of my brothers graduated from the Naval Academy. But my oldest brother always gives me challenges wherever I go. See, he, he likes, he's the older brother. He always asks me wherever I speak and he's in attendance, are you going to speak about me today? Are you going to mention my name? You know. He wants me to find him. Are you ready? I've never even heard of it. Jersey corn. <laughs> if I can get that by one o'clock, if someone can get me that, I'll pay for it, if you take credit. I'll pay for it. <laughs> no, listen, because then I'm going to go to Atlantic City and have it shipped overnight to him in Scottsdale, Arizona. So does anyone, Jersey corn, you know, the corn on, I guess it's corn on the cob. He says to me, he says, first of all, it's the best corn in the world. And the second thing he says is, I bet you can't do it. I was supposed to, see, I have these little notes. Well, the, I'm not, I'm not going to get it. You get the white corn and you bring it to me. I don't know what to get. That's why I'm saying Excuse me? No, no, no. Let, you organize this. I'm, don't be sending me, you know, I just need to send him some. Yes, ma'am. Will you? I'll, thank you very much. And, and I'll give you the credit card number. No, I'm serious. How, how am I going to find your address? How am I going to give you your address, my address? Oh, when I'm done. Okay, yes. You just send it to Scottsdale, Arizona. Send it to him. Okay? Don't send it to me. Thank you. What? Yeah, but I'll have him pay for me to come out to see him. And, uh, you know. Let me tell you another thing I don't understand. And then I'll go. I'll, I'll tell you the story 
next, tomorrow. But this is what I don't understand. So today I went to Philadelphia. What is this about paying to get into Philadelphia? <laughs> I don't understand this. You pay to get in Philadelphia, but it's free to come into New Jersey. So, I mean, I'm talking to the guy, and I'm like, he's telling me how much I owe him. I'm like, I don't have cash on me. I mean, I really think that this is a scam going on. Do you know that? You can, have any of you ever traveled back from... No, if you travel, I'm just letting you know something, serious. If you come into this state from Philadelphia, I'm just letting you know, it's free, okay? But if you want to leave this state, you have to pay. No one told me that. No, you think it's funny. It's not. I, have to, I had to pay today... And now I'm going back tomorrow night to catch a plane after our talk, and I'm going to have to pay again. <laughs> I'm just saying. The greatest compliment, by the way, and thanks be to God, I've gotten some very nice comments, but the greatest compliment I got, I can't find the man. I've got to find him. He might be in that room. I know he's here. He told me on the Saturday, Sunday morning, it was this gentleman. He told me Sunday morning, this is what he said to me. Are you from Jersey? That's what he said to me. He thought I was from Jersey. I take that as a great compliment. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that compliment. People, I will see you tomorrow, 7 o'clock again, our final night of our mission, and I hope, I hope I come back to this part of Jersey. I know I'm going to be speaking in February or October in Madison, New Jersey. Okay, yeah, great. I know they take credit up there, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but I want, to come, I want to come back to the shore. I want to come back to this area, all right? No, I, I'm serious. I mean, Atlantic City, I don't care. Just, I, I just want to come back. You, you people are, are wonderful and very, very family-oriented, and I appreciate the white corn, by the way, or my brother does. All right? How about we stand? I give you a blessing. The Lord be with you. May God's blessings be upon you all this day, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go forth. This mission is ended today but continues tomorrow 7 to 8 p.m., and if you wish, 1.30 to 2.30 tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye-bye.